Revelation 4 verse 1 says this. Then as I looked, this is John speaking, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like Jasper and Carnelian and the glow of an emerald and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. Now, this is the Apostle John, and we've already talked about uh, chapters one through three, which deal, uh, dealt with the churches that were there, Laodicea and Philippi, uh, Philadelphia and all of those churches. And so we're going to pick up in uh, verse uh, chapter four, verse one, and John is showing us what he's saying in the time to come. He's talking about some future events, some things uh, that the Lord Jesus is revealing to him. The first thing that we have to notice about this is this is actually a picture of, for your notes, the catch catching away of the church the catching away of the church Jesus is showing John what's going to happen in the end times and this is a picture of the catching away of the church if you're not careful you'll miss it because it says right here a door was open in heaven a door was open in heaven then he says come up hither come on up here John then he says a voice like a trumpet called him on up it talks about in the bible how that the heavens will be open christ will come down he's going to stand in the clouds and then his voice is going to sound like a trumpet and so he's calling john up he's actually allowing john to experience what the rapture is going to be like uh, for the church and then john says instantly i was in the spirit and i saw a throne and one sitting upon it for the church that's what it's going to be like in a moment in the twinkling of an eye the heavens are going to open jesus will descend and we're going to be able to hear his voice like a trumpet sounding and then we'll be caught up and we'll be in heaven instantly in the presence of the lord this is what uh the apostle john is experiencing and he's trying to give us an understanding of all of the things that will transpire amen then in the same text, what we find is very, this very interesting group of people. They're called the 24 elders. The 24 elders, they are the redeemed church. They're the redeemed church. Now, I'll spend some time unpacking this. In fact, in chapter five, we'll also see uh, from the 24 elders based on the song that they sing. It tells us exactly who they are. See, Revelation is really not a very, very difficult book because it tells you what's going on. It explains, it tells you a symbol, it tells you a mystery, and then later on down the line, it'll tell you what that individual or what those individuals or what that symbol uh, was all about. Amen? It tells us these 24 elders, the redeemed church, they were clothed in white robes. How many know that you're going to be clothed in white robes? How many know that you have already been made the righteousness of Christ and righteousness is always symbolized by white robes? Are you clothed in white this morning? Yeah. Whether you know you are, whether or not you know, you are clothed in white. Doesn't matter what you've been or what you've done or how you've looked. You have been clothed in white, not by virtue of your own works, but by the virtue of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. You're clothed here and you'll be clothed there. Amen. 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 What we have to understand here also is the Bible says there were crowns. They had crowns. These individuals, the 24 thrones, they had crowns. They were seated on thrones in heaven. So you do, guys do know we're going to have thrones in heaven. Amen. He said 24 thrones surrounded the throne and these guys had crowns on their head. We talked about last week about the rewards of being a Christian, about the rewards of living a life that is exemplary before Christ. So let's talk about these crowns just for a moment. The first crown I want to talk about, there are five that are revealed in scripture, but there are probably more than the five that we see right here. But the first one is the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness found in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, beginning at the eighth verse. The crown of righteousness. And this crown is for those that love the Lord's appearing. Those that love the Lord's appearing, what they're doing right now is putting off the works of darkness and embracing the kingdom of light. Do you love the Lord's appearance? Yeah. 
Do you love the Lord's appearing? If you love the Lord's appearing, what you're doing right now is you're sanctifying yourself so that you'll be in the best possible state that you can find yourself in when the Lord returns. Do you love the Lord's appearing? If you love the Lord's appearing, then you will be one that receives the crown of righteousness. Anybody want that crown? Amen. The second crown that the Bible tells us about is the crown of incorruptible, the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown that's found in first Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 25th verse. And this is uh, those that discipline their bodies or that were self controlled. They discipline their bodies and they were self controlled. Anybody have issues with self control in the house this morning? Let me tell you, you will be rewarded for how you manage yourself, for the control that you express or exert over your body. Pastor Anthony talked about the tongue. Do you know there is a reward that will be given to you if you learn how to discipline your tongue? If you learn how to manage yourself and comport yourself in a way that is glorious and that represents and reflects the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, there is a crown laid up in store for you called the incorruptible crown is there anybody in the house that wants the incorruptible crown now understand these crowns we're talking about they are eternal crowns these are the rewards of the righteous the rewards of heaven that we're going to receive if we live according to the way or the manner in which we can receive those crowns the next crown I want to talk about is the crown of life the crown of life. Now, this crown here is incredible. It's found in James, the first chapter, beginning at the 12th verse, and also in Revelation, the second chapter, beginning at the 10th verse. It is those for those that endure tests and trials patiently. Who endure tests and trials patiently. Anybody going through? Anybody got some hardships, some hard times? Has anybody been in some of those hardships or hard times for a long time? Let me let me tell you, let me tell you, if you deal with those and endure those hard times and those tempestuous moments that you're feeling right now, then there is a crown laid up for you based on how you went through that test and that trial. I, I know that it's tough. I know that it's hard and I know that you want it to be over right now. But let me tell you, if you'll manage yourself in the midst of this trial, in the midst of this test, then there is a crown of life laid up in store for you. That's not temporary. One that is eternal. Somebody say the crown of life. life. And then there's the crown of glory. The crown of glory that we find in first Peter, the fifth chapter, beginning at the second verse, the crown of glory. And this is about godly leaders who are examples to the flock. Godly leaders. Now, it's not just pastors. Now, I'm, I'm running for this one right here, y'all. I'm running for this one. This is not just for pastors, though. This is for leaders. Any leaders in the house that want this crown? Though, if, if you will... Reveal Christ in your day-to-day life. If you'll endure hardships patiently, if you'll love your wife and love the body of Christ, if you'll show forth the glory and demonstrate the goodness of God wherever you go, then there is a crown laid up in store for you as a leader in the church. Amen? And then there's the last crown that the Bible tells us about is the crown of rejoicing. Somebody say the crown of rejoicing. Now, we should all strive for this crown. It's found in 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, beginning at the 19th verse. This crown is for faithful witnessing. This crown is given to anyone that's a faithful witness, that loves to win souls. The Bible says that they'll shine for all of eternity, those who are wise and who win souls. There is a crown laid up in store for you. Any soul winners in the house this morning? Let me tell you, you will not lose your reward if you'll simply sacrifice and give of yourself and share the message of Jesus Christ with those around you. There is a crown that is laid up in store for you. Amen. Now, now understand this. It's okay to be greedy about kingdom rewards. It's, it's quite all right to covet 
eternal reward. In fact, eternal rewards should be something that motivates us to live and, and, and comport ourselves in a way that is conducive with the kingdom. Eternal rewards. We can say, I'm not losing my reward. I got to keep doing this. That's a, mo a, that's a righteous motivation for each and every one of us to do what God is asking us to do. You, it's okay to covet eternal rewards. Amen. We find also that they are seated on thrones. We talked about that just briefly. They're seated on thrones. Do you know that there will be rule and reign for the body of Christ for all of eternity in heaven? You don't know that. There will be rule and reign for each and every one of us in heaven. And your rule and your reign will be uh, designated or given to you based on the way that you live your life. Now, you're going to rule and reign. You are. But over what becomes the question? Over what? Will, will, it, will it be a village or will it be a city or will it be a nation? Will it be an entire people? Will it, what will it be that you're going to rule and reign over right now the way that we live our lives is determining how we're going to spend our eternity. Amen. So there are crowns. Somebody say crowns. And there are thrones. Somebody say thrones. Amen. The next thing it talks about is the seven spirits of God. That's the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit's going to be there in heaven with us? Seven is the number of perfection. It's the number of perfection. The Holy Spirit is the perfecter. He's the perfect full measure of the spirit. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus received the full measure of the spirit. Without measure, he received the Holy Spirit. He went about doing great things because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, we talked about this before when talking about the restrainer. When the, the Antichrist comes, the restrainer is going to be removed. That's the Holy Spirit. He'll be removed and the perfect spirit, the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit, he's going to be in heaven heaven with us amen there's a passage of scripture that talks about when that which is perfect is come referring to the gifts of the spirit when that which is perfect is come referring to Christ and referring to the catching away of the church then we'll know even as we are known do you know there'll be no need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit in heaven right now we need them because we know in part we need to be healed. We need to have revelation. We need to have power. Right now, we need all of the manifestations of the spirit of God alive and well in the church right now in this age. But in the age to come, we won't need those manifestations of the spirit of God because everybody will be healed. We'll all be whole. We'll have wisdom and knowledge about the son of God and about the father that we just cannot have right here if he told us it'd kill us right now. We won't have need for additional things because everything will be met in heaven with the Father. And so the seven spirits of God is symbolic of the Holy Spirit being with us. Go with me to verse 6 real quick. Verse 6 in chapter 5. Verse 6. In the front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third was like a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the almighty, the one who always was who is and who is still to come. These, these four living beings, they're cherubim before the throne of God. They're cherubim before the throne of God. A cherubim is the, the highest ranking level of angelic host, the cherubim. In fact, the Bible tells us that Lucifer was a cherubim. And he stayed in the presence of God 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. And there he ruled and he reigned. He covered the presence of God. He was a cherubim. These individuals, they're cherubim or they're angels. And they're constantly, perpetually in the presence of God. And they're the, the ones that evoke or promote worship in heaven. These cherubim. One of the reasons why Lucifer is so jealous of us is because of where we've been promoted to. 
See, Lucifer was once in the presence of God before he was demoted when pride rose um, in his heart and he wanted to exalt his throne against the throne of God. He was demoted. Well, God needed a replacement. God had a, a job opening. He had a job opening and and he needed to fill that job opening. So he created a creature that could fill that spot that could stand in heaven and that can worship before the Lord with his free will. Do you know that creature that God created to stand in heaven and worship before the throne is man? It's you and it's me. That's why we see the 24 elders. They're sitting in heaven with the living beings with the living creatures because we've been created to worship the presence of the Lord. Amen. The 24 elders are there worshiping around the throne of God. We are those 24 elders that the Bible is talking about. Verse 9, it reads like this. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, watch this, fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Our place is going to be worship before the throne. If you thought worship this morning was hot. And it was, it was hot. If you thought worship this morning was hot, then you don't even, you're not even ready for what's going to be happening in heaven when we go there. Worship's going to be so hot that those thrones, those crowns that we labor for here on the earth, those crowns that we fight for, those crowns that we covet right now, we're going to say, you know what, compared to what we're experiencing right now, this ain't nothing. This eternal reward means nothing to me. And we're going to take the crowns that we have and lay them at the feet of the Lord, recognizing it's only because of the Lord that we have become what we've become. We're going to realize that all of this means nothing. We'll take, take away everything else and just give me him. That's all that I'm going to need for all of eternity. We're going to lay before the lamb fall off of our thrones onto our faces take off our crowns and just sit there in the presence of the most high god now some of y'all are excited about that the rest of y'all you better get excited about that you know it's so important that we learn how to worship here because the interesting thing is when we find ourselves worshiping here we're actually worshiping there when we find ourselves here in worship before the throne of God, uh, what we're actually doing, we're being transported into the throne room of God in the spirit realm. And we're there worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so if you don't love worship here, you might not have that much fun in heaven. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Because one of the central themes of heaven is going to be the worship of the lamb the worship of our father the worship of all that he has done in our stead amen chapter five beginning at verse one i've got a few minutes left so i gotta fly real quick chapter five verse one and i saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals and i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof and no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book neither to look thereon says John he sees this book. This book is beautiful. In fact, this book is believed to be the title indeed to the earth. It's believed to be everything, ownership of everything that Adam forfeited, that Adam lost. See, only a man can have complete and total dominion over the earth. Only a man can because God set man as the dominant force in the earth. And so only a man can stand as a as an individual that rules and reigns over the earth. Only a man can do that. No angel can do it. 
Because angels didn't receive that position. Only a man did. So Adam, when Adam sinned, he abandoned what God gave to him, the dominion over the earth. God said, uh, have dominion and replenish. Adam, he abandoned his rightful ownership that God gave to him. And so Jesus had to come. And so John is looking around for a man that can do it. He says, no man can do this. So he wept bitterly. Because he recognized if a man couldn't do it, it couldn't be done. No one could take or was worthy to take the seal from the hand of him who held it. Amen. Amen. But then comes verse five. And one of the elders said to me, I hope this elder is me. (laughs) God, I'm asking to be that one elder. The elder said to me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He says there is someone. You don't see him yet, but there is someone that has already fought and won the battle. And he alone has authority and the ability to open up, uh, to grab a hold of these seals. And he says, and I beheld and see in the middle of the throne and of the four beasts. Watch this. And in the middle of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes talking of the spirit which is which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne this is this is beautiful because it says this man he was standing among the 24 elders. This is so, so beautiful. And I'll unpack some of that in a moment. But it's so beautiful. But this lamb that was slain, he stood up. And this lamb went before the throne. And he grabbed the book. He grabbed the seals in his hand. Because he alone was worthy to take the book out of his hand. The lamb that had been slain was. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts And four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, watch this, listen to this song they sang. You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And have made us to our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. He says this individual he rose up and he took the book. And the, the, the living creatures along with the 24 elders, they fell down in worship and they begin to sing a new song. A new song is oftentimes symbolic of transition. It's symbolic of a shift in authority. It's symbolic of something brand new coming on the scene. He, he stood up and they began to sing a new song and they sung to the lamb because he was the only one that was able to redeem their souls from destruction. Do you know the lamb this morning? The apostle John he, uh, or John the Baptist, he said, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. If you're still confused about who this lamb is, the lamb is Jesus. Jesus was the one that gave his life as a ransom, as a sacrifice for all of humanity so that we could come to know God. And the only reason why we'll be able to stand in the presence of God on that day is because of the blood work of Jesus Christ, because of the cross and because of what he has done in our stead. You're not worth You'll never be worthy, but it's only through Christ Jesus that you receive right and access to the holy of holies. Amen. Amen. Jesus stood among the 24 elders for your notes. Jesus stood among the 24 elders. This verse, I love this verse because it speaks right to where we are. Hebrews, the second chapter beginning at the 11th verse. Watch this. It says this. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Watch this. He says, I will declare your name 
to my brothers and sisters in the assembly talking about among in the midst of my brothers and sisters I will sing your praises do you know when we get together and sing and worship before the Lord Jesus is there singing with us he says in the assembly I'll declare your praises so whenever we gather together and worship God as one unit on a Sunday morning together Jesus he's here and he's singing right along with us amen and again I will put my trust in him and again he says here am I and the children God has given me since the children have flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death Watch this, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. That's why he's standing among the 24 elders, because he was made fully human in every way. So he is the God man. He's fully man and he's fully God. Only Jesus has the ability to be fully man and fully God. And he's standing in the midst of the 24 elders. Uh, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus alone is worthy to take the scroll. It also talks about the harp and the bowl. The harp is worship. The harp is worship. The bowl is the prayers of the saints. Have you ever been concerned that your prayers weren't being heard? Have you ever prayed something and thought the answer should have already been here by now? And maybe it, it hasn't arrived yet? Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you, your prayers made heaven's courtroom. Your prayers, they're there. In fact, they're being collected and God is going to answer each and every one of the prayers that you pray. In fact, he's probably already answered them and you're just waiting on the manifestation of that thing to come to pass. But when you pray, they're being collected in heaven and the Bible says it's as a sweet smelling savor. It's like incense rising into the nostrils of God. God loves to hear his people pray. God loves to smell the aroma, smell the atmosphere that's created when his people pray. Do you know you should be a praying fool because God loves the prayers of his people that's why the bible says the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail much why because when you pray they ascend into the nostrils of god into the very throne room of god they're in heaven in the holy place and god is there to answer those that cry out to them that's why he says you can come boldly into the presence of god boldly and receive or request the things that you have need of amen here's here's the last thing i'm gonna throw you away i know it's getting late the last thing I'll throw away says this. They were made to be kings and priests. They were made to be kings and priests. Now, this is significant because recognize there are only two other individuals that were named king and priest. One was Melchizedek. He was the king of Salem and a priest unto God. The other was Jesus He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he's the high priest to all things that pertain to the church. There are three people, though, that have the title of king and priest. It's the 24 elders. They've been named kings and priests. It's Jesus, king and priest, and Melchizedek, king and priest. You have a special role in heaven, people of God. Now, a king has the ability to rule. A king has a throne room. A king has authority to execute judgment. A king has the ability to loosen, to bind. A king has incredible, incredible influence. But a king can't go into the holy place. A king can't go into the holies of holies or he'll die. He'll be struck down dead. A king can't do that. A priest has the ability to go into the holy place. A priest can worship in the very presence of God. A priest has access to the throne room of God, but most priests can't go into the king's throne room. They don't have authority to rule. They can't legislate and be, uh, be uh, their word be bond. Most priests can't do that. They're isolated to the temple. But he says we're both kings and priests.
That means we have authority and dominion and the power to rule and to reign. And we have access into the throne room of God whenever we get ready. We're kings and priests, people of God. And we've been made to be this. This isn't something that we've gained or earned on our own. We are both king and priest because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Do you know you have authority to bind and loose? That's kingship. That's rulership. That's dominion. That's ownership. You can tell something to come and something to go and it'll come and go as you beckon it to or tell it to. But you also have the ability to step into the throne room of God and make requests and worship him right in his presence. That's who you've been made to be. One more text and I'm done. Ephesians, the second chapter. I'm skipping over some stuff. Ephesians, the second chapter, beginning at the fourth verse, it says this. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You have been raised together in Christ. You are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so as kings and as priests, exercise your rulership. Exercise, exercise your privileges. Exercise your rights because God has made you both kings and priests unto our God. Amen. 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 See, Revelation is not that hard of a book, is it? It's not that difficult to understand. It's all right there in front of you if we just read what it has to say. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your people. Thank you, God, for all the wonderful things that you have in store for us. God, we thank you that you've made us to be kings and priests. God, we thank you that we've been made after the kingly order and after the priestly order. We thank you, God, that you're coming to receive us unto yourself. In